So today we will be doing a review of the book Eight Rules for Life by Jay Shetty and we'll also be doing a gym sesh at the same time. I wanted to kill two birds with one stone. I've been meaning to make this video for a bit. I want to post every Wednesday and Saturday and it's Wednesday so I need to post. But I also needed to work out and I figure I can talk and work out at the same time. So that's what we're going to be doing. Let's get into it. All right, so the first chapter says, let yourself be alone. And he talks about how he often, how people use other people to fill the void in their lives, to fill the void of loneliness and how it often long term doesn't work. You may get the instant gratification of someone else being in, the, in your presence and forgetting about your loneliness, but there's always going to be times when you're alone and you're not actually working at the problem, you're just patching a hole over it. He talks about the difference between solitude and loneliness and that how they're basically the same thing, but it's just a different mindset. It's a lens in which we view our time alone. And that there's glory in solitude. Like I think about how at the moment I'm sitting in a gym by myself talking to a camera and it's kind of lonely. Like I could be thinking, oh, I got no mates. Like what am I doing? But it's something that I enjoy that I'm, I don't feel lonely because it's something I want to do and I'm working on myself and the things that I care about. So it's just a matter of how you frame things. So he challenges you to do something by yourself every week for a month and analyze how you feel. So these are quite scary things, like going to a restaurant by yourself, doing a hike by yourself, going to a singing class, a movie, another sort of class with something you need to learn and doing it all by yourself. And then thinking about, do you, need, do you feel the need to go on your phone to feel like you're doing something and so to compensate that feeling of being alone? Um, or to be productive at the same time? How would your opinion of the task change if you're under the influence of someone else doing it, if you're doing it with someone else? He says language has created the word loneliness to express the pain of being alone. And then he also says it's created the word solitude to express the glory of being alone. And it all depends on how you view these two words and the lens in which you view your time alone. There's, there's glory in being alone. All right, rule two is don't ignore your karma. So it says that you attract basically what you put out and therefore pay close attention to your attitude. Say, for instance, if your attitude is that you want to fix people, that you want to fix something, then everyone will look like a problem to you. He says that oxytocin, which is the chemical that's released during sex, is like an amplifier to any brain activity that you're already experiencing. So we feel more in love when we're having sex with someone. We feel closer chemically and emotionally and it temporarily, blo temporarily blocks the negative things, like maybe the little things that are bothering you and you keep thinking it's going to be okay because your brain is temporarily blocking the bad things about the relationship and you don't see the red flags. Another thing he says, which I can relate to, is that we assess the quality of a relationship with how long it lasted. Like We feel like we get more out of a longer relationship. Well, that's actually not the case. We, what uh, we get out of a relationship is what we learned from it. And therefore, you must understand your choices and what you went through and assess them to then pick and be better next time. And that's how you get the most out of a relationship. Um, a thing that resonated with me is put out what you want to attract. So for me, it's like putting out the version of myself that I want, to, that I want other people to be attracted to. So for me, those things are like being intellectual, being hardworking, being adventurous and liking exercise, and then also being like emotionally intelligent and being interested in personal growth because they're the things that I want people to value in me. If I'm putting out like pictures of me, if I'm just like making gym TikToks or whatever and putting out videos of me in the gym flexing, I don't want someone to be attracted to me just for like my physique or my attitude towards the gym. There's a lot more to me and I want to put out the things that I am proud of myself for. And I think everyone should because we want people to be attracted to us for the things that we value about ourselves, not maybe surface level things like our looks. 
The third rule is define love before you think it, feel it, or say it. What does I love you mean to you? Is it a big deal? Do you say it to your postman? Think about your definition of love and share it with others. We must define love before we say it. It means different things to different people. When you say it to a partner, we are taking on their definition of love. When your partner does it to us, we must understand that it is coming from their definitions. So I think this is really important because when we hear I love you, we are thinking about our definition of love and putting it onto what someone else is saying to us. And when we say it, we're also talking about our definition of love. Therefore, to understand the words, I love you well, we must understand our partner's definition of that word. Therefore, when our partner says those words to us, we understand where it is coming from and what it means to them, and they also understand what it means to us so that there is no miscommunication, and we understand what those words mean for both of us. It's late and I'm editing in this video, but I realize I've got to introduce rule four. And rule four is your partner is your guru. They are someone you should learn from, with, and through. They are your long-term life partner, and they should also be your long-term life teacher. You should never stop growing together. Another takeaway from this chapter is he gives us seven questions to ask our partner to deepen our relationships with them. They are, what should I do more of? What should I do less of? What do I do that makes you feel confident? What do I do that makes you feel anxious? What is your love language? What is your fight style? And is the relationship going in your desired direction? And these are kind of deep questions to ask your partner to get to the bottom of how they're feeling about the relationship and what you can do to help make the relationship better. And he also encourages them to ask you the questions so that you can think what how you want to make the relationship better. The fourth rule is purpose comes first. Sometimes you have to do something that is important to you and you have to do it alone. You have to support your partner in their goals and expect the same for you and your goals. He talks about the Vedas, which are the oldest texts in Hinduism, which have four pursuits. The pursuits are Dharma, your purpose, Artha, your work and finance, Karma, your pleasure and connection and relationships with others. And Moksha, your liberation from the material world and your connection with the spirit. And the Vedas are intentional about the order of these. The pursuits overlap and are interconnected throughout our lives. The first pursuit, though, is your Dharma, your purpose. You should never sacrifice this in a relationship. This should always come first. Sometimes you may have to change Put your purpose on hold, but it should always be there in your mind and you should be working towards it. The sixth rule is win or lose together. It's normal and healthy to disagree, but if you approach a conflict as a team, you'll fight the situation instead of each other. He says to sit side by side in a cooperative position when having a discussion or arg argument and allows for eye contact and mirroring naturally. So he proposes the idea of having a conflict agreement. The point of the agreement is to try and limit your emotions and you saying things that you're going to regret later and have a grown-up discussion about the aims of the argument and how you're going to come to the conclusion. So he gives an example of conflict agreement. And it says, we agree to pick a time and place for this conflict instead of having it right now. We agree that if we come to an agreement, we both win. Yeah. But if one person wins, we both lose. Our intention is to... Either find a compromise, understand each other's feelings, address the issue with a solution that will help us avoid an argument in the future, support each other even though we disagree. I think this is great and it can apply to any argument. The point of an argument is to come to a solution and not to convince the other person that you're right. Because even if you do convince the person you're right, you may win the argument, but deep down they're going to feel resentment towards you long term and they're not actually going to agree with you, they'll probably just agree with you to finish the argument and they'll still hold their beliefs deep down so it doesn't actually achieve anything. When you're having an argument with a partner or anyone, you want to try and get to a conclusion where you both understand each other and you can both agree on things without convincing the other person that you're right. This next rule, rule seven, is perfect for a breakup. And I'm going to go through a meditation, which is basically a love letter to yourself. 
So if you're going through a breakup, this is for you. I've saved this letter as a highlight because I think it's really good for reflection and appreciating your self-worth when all you want to do is break. So the rule's called don't break in a breakup. Don't run away at the first sign of difficulty, but always remember that you're still a whole, lovable, valuable person all on your own. The chapter's really good, and I recommend reading it if you've had a breakup, if you're unsure whether to break up with a person or not, when a breakup is the right action, and when it's time to just work on things more. The letter goes, Dear Self, we have been together since the beginning, and it means everything to me that I get to experience life with you. You're closer to me than anyone, the only one that knows all that I've been and done, the only one that has witnessed the world through my eyes, who knows my deepest thoughts, my darkest fears, and my biggest dreams. We've been through a lot together, everything in fact, the highest highs and the lowest lows. You're with me in the greatest moments, and the ones I would like to do over. No matter what, you're always, you've always stuck by me. We're true partners, and you're the only one from whom I can say without a doubt that we will always be together. But in spite of your loyalty and your caring, I've sometimes ignored you. I haven't always listened to you when you told me what's best for me or nudged me in the direction I should go. Instead of looking to you, I looked outwards at what others were doing and saying. I distracted myself when I should have heard your voice. Instead of caring for you, I sometimes push too hard. Yet, you have never abandoned me. You always forgive me and welcome me home without judgment or criticism. For all that, I thank you. Thank you for being gentle with me, for being strong, for always being willing to learn and grow with me through my mistakes and struggles. Thank you for, over and over, reflecting back to me the best of what's inside of me. Thank you for showing me what unconditional love truly means. Love me. I think that letter's pretty powerful. If you're ever going through a tough time, read this or listen to this, and it'll make you appreciate yourself. The eighth and final rule is love again and again. Broaden your view of love and experience it with everyone. The ancient Greeks had six different words for love. There's many different types. There's love as being part of a community or a team. There's love for the environment and for nature and for the things you see. There's self-love. There's love for your family, love for your friends, obsessive love. And you can experience love in many different ways. And this chapter talks about how once you've learnt to be by yourself, to experience love, to get over love, then you can learn how to share love with the world. And if everyone shares love, then it's contagious and the world will be a better place. All in all, I reckon it was a really good book. I learned a lot. Um, it was definitely good listening to it as an audio book because some, there's some bits that are pretty slow. There's some really good bits and good quotes and good highlights, but then sometimes it gets a bit repetitious. So listening to it as an audio book, you can kind of zone out through those bits and then you zone back in when there's something that is of value. Um, yeah, but I'm keen on reading his other book, Think Like a Monk, but I've got a pretty big reading list, so who knows when I'll get onto it. At the moment, I'm reading The E-Myth, Revisited, and Diary of a CEO, and then I'm listening to 48 Laws of Power, which I've been listening to for, for a while, but I just restarted, resumed it, and I'm also listening to $100 Million Office by Alex Formosi. So, yeah. I don't know if you enjoyed this little, wait, can you see me? Yeah. I don't know if you enjoy, enjoyed this little gym slash book review. It's kind of just a funny idea. If you have any feedback, let me know. But I'm going to continue with my gym workout. And now I've got to film a little reel because my New Year's resolution is to film a reel every day of stuff I've learnt in books and whatever. So, yeah, let's keep going. Moving up to the 27th. Thank <laughs> you.
That was surprisingly alright. I've been doing like 20, 22s or something. And I'm on my cart, so I'm lifting, lifting less weight. But that was actually alright. It's just hot, and I don't want to turn the, the aircon on because then I have more noise in the video, which kind of sucks. So I just got to embrace the heat. Alright, so I'm doing, I do 27 kilos on one side and 35 on the other side because I can't hold the weight up properly with too much weight with this hand because it's too crooked. So that's why I'm like struggling with more with one hand than the other hand. Blah. Alright, let's go. I'm listening to some mad, that's not gonna work. Some J. Cole, some old J. Cole is lit. That one's hard. If it's good poop booby pump though. And I feel like it's good to do after incline dumbbell press because it's kind of the same. So your muscles are more tired and it feels like it's working a lot. And you can do like drop sets easy on it. Not heavy enough. Ah. <sighs> 
new mic, new night, mic technique tings. Look at us go. Sam Sulek pioneered the mic with the hat. I'm pioneering the mic as a hair clip. So right now, I'm not feeling the pump I should be to finish the workout. I feel like I need more of a pump to finish the workout. So I'm doing more of these. Here we go, have you. Drops it. I need to finish with nothing left. I'm going to try set fully depleted. This is getting hard. Oh, that's really light. Not anymore. All right, my titties are feeling good and striations are looking good. I'm pretty happy with how I'm looking on this cut. Oh yeah, and be like Sam. <sighs> okay, so I, I do think like posing and filming posing is pretty cringe because I don't know it doesn't suit me. I'm not like the most, <sighs> I don't know how to say this without, not, without sounding. I feel like because I know I have like a decent body Whenever I have my shirt off, it like becomes a thing and it becomes a thing like I'm flexing or like I'm trying to show it off. And I don't like that that's a thing. Like I wish I could just roll around with no shirt and it'd be normal. So that's why I don't like taking my shirt off. But then I also like, I'm just, I think, who cares? Like I can just be myself and roll around with no shirt and not think about that. But I always have that thought in the back of my head that if I am rolling around with no shirt on, then people will think like, oh, look at this guy, I think he's so good, whatever. But like, I need to stop thinking what people think. So the reason I do this posing is because it's good to like, see your progress. Okay, I need to get more of a boob pump. I feel like my boob, boob pump has gone away a bit. I feel like when I was doing this before, it looked cooler. But like, I'm gonna look back at this in the bulk and be like, holy shit, I was so shredded. I got like, you can't really see in the light, but I got stomach veins right now, and that shit looks so cool, I reckon. But yeah, my thoughts on posing, I don't like it because it looks like you're flexing, but you're just seeing your own personal progress, so freak what other people think, you know? Anyway. <sighs> I 
Man, vacuums are hard. It's hard to like have a normal face in them. 